morning worship as per normal on this Sunday morning. Remember, we were, were supposed to have not had it because there, the electric company was going to come in and cut the power for the whole weekend and put the meters together and do all of that work. But somebody along the way didn't quite get done what they needed to get done, so it's not going to be done this weekend. So we will all be here uh, this Sunday morning. And uh, I will be on vacation, but Taylor... Taylor Williams is going to be here, and Doug, I sent you a thing on Taylor earlier to go out so people know who he is. Some of you don't know who he is, but Taylor is was a pastor of, I think it was Grace Bible Church in San Jose for 25 years, Had his, got his, uh, went, went to uh, uh, Western, uh, Conservative, Western Theological Seminary where he got his, uh, I, I don't know if he had an MDiv or, or THM. But he's certainly well qualified to to uh, pastor. He was on several ordaining committees that I was on, so I think you'll enjoy him. He and his wife retired, as he said, to the Holy Land of Texas um, a few years ago, and so they live in in Shirts, Texas, which is just north of Pants, Texas, I think, or <laughs> just south of Pants, Texas. Okay. And they are, um, and they live stream all the time. They've been here. This was the first year I really missed seeing them at the pastors' conference. But they've been here every year at the pastors' conference. They live stream all the time, so they know all the uh, drill and protocols and everything. So I think that'll be everybody will enjoy having them, uh, having them here. So trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will direct your paths. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not grow weary. They shall walk and not faint. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, shall defend your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. For the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Before we get started, let's have a few moments of silent prayer to make sure you're in fellowship, ready to study the word, ready to focus on what God the Holy Spirit has to teach us. Uh, this evening as we study his word to strengthen us in our spiritual life and to challenge us to continue to press forward in our spiritual growth. Let's pray. Father, as we study your word from Genesis to Revelation, we are impressed with how all of the parts fit together into a unified whole that whether it is the author Moses writing 1,400 years before Christ or whether it is the Apostle John in 95 A.D. or the Apostle Paul or Nehemiah or Zechariah, Zephaniah, whoever the author is, they're simply writing that which complements and builds upon previous revelation. And now in our study in Hebrews 11, We are brought to a tremendous chapter reviewing the history of key individuals in the Old Testament that were used by you because they trusted you, because they, at key times in their lives, they were willing to trust you completely. And it is those instances that are reviewed by the author of Hebrews to remind us that even though they never saw the promises fulfilled in their lifetime, they didn't give up, they didn't Uh, fade out. They didn't quit. They kept uh, pursuing their own spiritual growth. They kept believing in the promises, and it is that faith that is the example that they have been, they are to us. Even though we live in a different dispensation, nevertheless, they are examples of what it means to press on and to not grow weary. Father, challenge us with the things we see and study this evening. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, open your Bibles uh, to Exodus chapter 11. Exodus chapter 11, 
and I'll just review a little bit for you where we have been in our study in Hebrews. On this first chart, we look at three of the five instances that the writer of Hebrews focuses on in relationship to to Moses' life, how Moses is an example of faith to these Jewish believers in Jesus Christ, these early Messianic uh, Christians in, in Israel, in Judah, who are under pressure and are about to give up and tempted to give up their belief that Jesus is the Messiah and fade back into Judaism. And so the writer of Hebrews is writing to warn them of the terrible consequences that that will have. What hits me as I read Hebrews and in my uh, morning Thursday morning Greek class with, uh, with several pastors, we've been reading through 1 John, and it's true also in, in 1 John that fellowship is, we tend to think of fellowship as relational and based upon sin. If you sin, you're out of fellowship. If you are, stay without sinning, then you stay in fellowship. But in that book and in Hebrews, the key issue is doctrinal consistency. That in First John, if you don't have the right view of the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, that He appeared in the flesh and was qualified in His humanity to go to the cross, then you're out of fellowship. Fellowship is first doctrinal, then it's related to sin. So the sin in First John that gets you out of fellowship is heresy. It is bad theology. It is a bad Christology. And in Hebrews, the issue is just giving up on the fact that Jesus is the Messiah. So, so it starts with doctrine, a doctrinal belief at, that's at the very core, which is a little bit different from the way most of us think about fellowship uh, most of the time. So with these examples, Moses is an example of one who persevered. And if you think about the timeline here, he's 40 years old when the second event takes place, and he rec- recognizes his his destiny to uh, follow follow to be identified with the uh, Israelites and to reject all that had been provided for him as an Egyptian, and so he leaves Egypt. So you have these two event number two and event number three are very close to one another in terms of the timeline, and then. The next event comes 40 years after that, which is the event related to the, related to the Passover. Hebrews 11.27 said that by faith he forsook, love the resounding nature of the uh, King James there. <clears throat> Literally, it's just by faith he left Egypt, uh, not fearing. And as I pointed out in the exegesis, that's a causal participle because he was not afraid of the wrath of the king. Now, when you read Exodus, it looks like he is afraid of the wrath of the Pharaoh, but this is showing that he had already made a decision to leave prior to the event where the uh, Pharaoh is threatening him. And the basis for that is that he endured as one who saw or one who sees him who is invisible. And so his focus is on God. That is, God is the motivator of his spiritual life, not the details of life, not what he's going to get out of things, but the person of God, his person, his plan for Israel. And so then he spends 40 years in in Midian before God appears to him on Mount Horeb or Mount Sinai in the burning bush. Then God commissions him to go back to be the deliverer. So he's 80 years old. He packs up his uh, wife and uh, children, and he heads back to heads back to Egypt. Then we <clears throat> read in the next verse, Hebrews eleven twenty eight focuses on the next event. By faith, Moses kept the Passover, and I think this is one of those uh, one of those figures of speech in the Scripture where the Passover really stands for the entire set of the ten plagues that came upon Egypt. The Passover. The plague of the death of the firstborn is the greatest and most intense of the ten plagues. And the ten plagues, as we saw the last time, builds to this uh, final great dramatic demonstration of God's power over the firstborn of Egypt and the deliverance that God 
uh, has for Israel, where he redeems them through this substitutionary uh, sacrifice. And so Hebrews 11.28 says that by faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest he who destroyed the firstborn, which would be God, uh, God the Father, would destroy, should touch them. So he keeps the fat Passover because he is trusting in God. Faith always has an object, so he is trusting in the promise of God, which God gave to him in, <clears throat> in the first part of the 11th chapter of Exodus. Last time we went through the 10 plagues, or 10 judgments, that God brought upon, uh, brought upon Egypt, which completely wiped out and devastated their their whole military industrial complex, their economy was wasted. God destroyed Egyptian society. He wiped out their religious basis, but nevertheless it, it rebuilds because the arrogance of the human soul in rebellion against God is such that he is going to refuse to bow the knee to the Creator, and he is going to worship the creature instead. And I pointed out last time, as we looked at these ten plagues, that each one of these plagues is related to one of the deities, one or more deities, in the pantheon of the uh, of the Egyptians. Now, this chart I took out of the uh, Bible Knowledge Commentary um, section on uh, Exodus, which was that commentary was written by John Hanna. Uh, this idea, though, uh, is not unique to the Bible Knowledge Commentary. There are numerous different uh, commentators who have noted the parallels. Why does God bring these particular judgments? And they are also, uh, a, a, in a way, foreshadowing of the kind of judgments in a much greater degree that will come during the tribulation period. So this becomes a watershed event in, 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 in Re Revelation, in the history of Israel, one that is referred to numerous times later in the Old Testament, one that is referred to numerous times by uh, the Lord in the Gospels as well as in the New Testament. It is because the Exodus stands as a teaching event for two key things. The first is substitutionary redemption, and that is the Passover. When you think of Passover, we should think of substitutionary redemption. A payment is made. It's interesting, this last week I was talking with, uh, with Eager, about some different theological things, especially in terms of translation issues. I had met last week with an old friend of mine, uh, Dr. Joe Wall, who's now the director, uh, vice president for East West Ministries, and the director uh, and his responsibilities, training and development of, of, um, of, of their uh, staff. And one of the books that they've been trying to get into print to use with training pastors in the former Soviet Union is a book written, uh, the original title was Between Calvinism and Arminianism by, um, hmm, name escapes me now. Um, it's on the tip of my tongue. Um, Olson, by, by uh, Olson, I'll come up with his first name in just a minute. And I first met him several years ago, about 10 years ago. He gave a paper that became a chapter in this book on um, uh, foreknowledge, and uh, Gordon Olson. And Gordon uh, is retired. I, I'm amazed he's still alive. He's had so many heart problems over the last 10 years. It's just amazing. In fact, he had had a heart attack just about a month before um, that, that conference. Uh, that was in Philadelphia about, two th I don't know when it was, 2001 or 2000. Dan Ingram and I met down there and, and went to that conference. And that was the first time I had met Gordon, although I, I hadn't connected his name with the manuscript. But somebody had sent me the manuscript, emailed me the manuscript of his book, big 400-page book, where he really deals with a lot, of, uh, a lot of issues related to the whole issue of Calvinism versus Arminianism. And he does a great job and a uh, tremendous job in that book. And then it was um, <clears throat> it was abridged a little bit, and it came out again as a paperback called Getting the Gospel Right, with a foreword by Tim LaHaye, which I thought was kind of ironic, because Tim LaHaye tends to be a little lordship, and Tim is also a little more... Well, Tim, Tim doesn't like Calvinism, 
but he tends to be lordship. So that's just kind of an odd, odd thing. But Tim wrote the, Dr. LaHaye wrote the uh, forward to that book. And Gordon has had it, it's been translated into Russian, but it hadn't been printed yet because uh, he did not want to go to print until someone who understood his theology, who was a native Russian speaker, could read it to double check it to make sure that the translation was right. Now, y'all may not realize this, but translation is not easy. I have always wondered about people who went out and took certain books and uh, translated them, and, and you, they'd come back and five years later say, oh, we've got all these uh, books and all these things that we've translated into whatever the language is. And um, it, it's hard. I mean, the people who are doing the translating really have to have a firm grasp of theology. English has had five, at least 500 years of technical theological language development, if you think about it. English was not a well-spoken language in 1500. But by 1620, it was firmly established. And it happened because of the English Bible, because of the translation of those early early Bibles by, uh, by Tyndale and by Miles Coverdale and, by, and the Geneva Bible that was translated into English. And all of that culminated in of course, that great work of, uh, of English prose, and it really is. I mean, it, it, the King James Bible, one day I'm going to do a study on this for everybody. It is, I've read five or six books on this in the last couple of years, and it is a remarkable work of translation. Nobody spoke like that. They elevated, they didn't translate the King James into the Koine of the day, but they, they elevated it into just a glorious masterpiece of literature that has so many different uh, elements to it, but it is, it's, it's written at the same time that Shakespeare is writing his plays, and this is just a, the heyday of Victorian English when English becomes, becomes established. Well, if you think about what happens during that period with the Reformation still going on and the development and rise of, of Puritanism and Puritan theology and all of the good senses and good things that that brought to the study of the Scriptures and bringing the Scripture into the language of the people, that you have a development in all of this argumentation that's going on at, at a theological level. You have the, the foundation laid for a rich vocabulary in English to accurately translate the Greek language into English. We have all of these rich words that have been developed. Even we have the, the, the word atonement, which is basically an English invention based on the word at one -ment, which is what it came from, is, is to, coining a whole new word to represent the totality of what Christ did on the cross. And that word atonement, which you find in any decent systematic theology, is going to have a number of chapters dealing with the nature of the atonement, the extent of the atonement, uh, <clears throat> and, and dealing with the whole Old Testament teaching on atonement. But in Russian, there are th there's, there are, there's only one word that's used to translate atonement, propitiation, uh, redemption. All these different words, there's only one word. That, that is, there's a poverty in most languages when you try to translate over, they don't have technical language there. So if you're, if you're reading a passage and it uses the word redemption, in Russian it uses the same word it would use for atonement or the same word it would use for cleansing or the same word it would use for uh, reconciliation or propitiation. And this gets very confusing. So Igor and I were talking about uh, some of the problems related to that. And it looks like he's going to be able to uh, work things out with uh, Gordon Olson to uh, double check this this uh, this this the theological work. But you have to really have to be adept in the target language, and you have to have a good understanding of theological nuance to do that kind of translating. Otherwise, if, if you're and we've run into this problem, I remember ten years ago when we were in Kazakhstan. We had a man who was uh, had translated for a number of different uh, e English-speaking uh, pastors and <coughs> and professors who had come over to speak for this this some other seminary that was there, 
And so Jim Myers had hired him to translate for us. And this guy was butchering what we were saying so much. But at the end of the second day, Jim called up his main translator in Kiev, Margaret, flew Margaret to Almaty to do the translation because this guy had never had anybody talk about all these different kinds of words, like, like I'm, as I'm explaining to you, like propitiation, redemption, expiation. And he, he was just stumbling all over the place because he had never had another English-speaking teacher come in and talk about these, these kinds of things, which is kind of a sad commentary. But it shows the challenges, <coughs> the challenges that we have with, uh, with, with translation. So when we get into talking about the Exodus event, the picture here is just of that. It is substitutionary atonement. And it is such a great, rich picture with the death of the Passover lamb that it amazes me that in the early church, because they had divorced themselves from the Jewish background, in the early 2nd century, after the Bar Kokhba revolt in 135, the Gentile Christians pretty much ostracized the Jewish Christians. And they began to interpret the Old Testament and the New Testament totally within a Greek sort of background, and they lost the meaning, the significance of a lot of Old Testament passages. And it wasn't until the Reformation, and late, uh, well, earlier than the Reformation, but almost a thousand years before certain things were, were recovered. And when, Ab, uh, when Anselm first clearly articulated a substitutionary atonement about 1000 uh, A.D., that could have been done five, six, seven hundred years earlier if they had just really understood the Old Testament sacrificial system. But by divorcing themselves from the Jewish backgrounds, and which is part of an anti-Semitism that leaked in, you lost this whole concept of substitutionary atonement. So the Passover represents substitutionary atonement, and the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which begins with the day of Passover, is the first day of the week-long Feast of Unleavened Bread, speaks of separation, which is exactly what is happening in the Passover event as God is separating his people from Egypt. And it's a picture of the believer being separated uh, from the world. And then the the Passover, I mean, the, uh, the, the event where they go through the Red Sea, and Moses parts the Red Sea, is an identification with Moses in his faith. So it is a picture, a foreshadowing of the baptism by the Holy Spirit, as Paul points out in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. So these events are really important because God gives us these little snapshots to help us to understand these more abstract doctrines that we get into in the New Testament referred to as substitutionary atonement, referred to as uh, the separation of the believer from the world, consecration. It's related to the whole doctrine of sanctification, as well as the concept uh, of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So, verse 28 focuses on uh, Moses keeping the Passover. So let's look at the uh, description of this in Exodus chapter 11 and 12. The Lord said to Moses, first, first three verses focus on the God giving initial instructions uh, to Moses. In the first verse, he, for the first time, indicates the limits on the plagues. Up to this point, Moses doesn't know how many there are going to be. They're just keep, they just keep coming and he has no idea when they are going to end and when the Pharaoh will finally release the Israelites. The Lord said, I will bring one more plague on Pharaoh and on Egypt. Afterward, he will let you go from here. When he lets you go, he'll sure you, surely drive you out of here altogether. In other words, God gives a promise here that this is it. And when this occurs, Pharaoh will finally and completely tell you to leave. So then he instru- gives Moses instructions on what he should tell the people. He says, speak to the people. Let every man ask from his neighbor and every woman from her neighbor articles of silver and articles of gold. For 430 years they had been slaves in Egypt. Now they're getting their payday. This isn't 
a, um, they're not stealing the money. They're asking for the Egyptian who, masters to give them whatever, uh, whatever they have, and the people do it. That's the thrust of verse 3. And the Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. The Egyptians were glad to do it. In other words, they, uh, the, the word there for favor indicates grace. And the, the Egyptians were glad to do it. And the reason is because of Moses. The next sentence says, Moreover, the man Moses was very great in the land of Egypt, in the sight of the Pharaoh's servants, and in the sight of the people. So there is a motivation now not only to avoid further, uh, further judgments, but also because of, because of Moses and the Egyptians who had always hated the Semites and had a strong anti-Semitic prejudice, willingly give to the Jews all, of their, all, all that they have that's valuable. Verse 4, then Moses said, thus says the Lord, <clears throat> this is what he is going to say to the people and to Pharaoh, about midnight I will go out into the midst of Egypt. Now it doesn't say midnight tonight, midnight tomorrow, midnight next week. So there's a vagueness here to give Pharaoh time to uh, think about it as to how he will respond. About midnight I will go out in the midst of Egypt, and all the firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die. Now this is important because the eldest had the right of primogenitor. He is the heir. He received the double portion of the inheritance. He is the one who was to carry on the family name, especially among the aristocracy and in among the royalty. It is the firstborn that got the greatest education. So if the firstborn is wiped out, you're basically destroying the intellectual capital of the next generation. You're wiping out those who had in the, the, that, that generation that had received the best education available in Egypt. So it's not only that, but as the firstborn of Pharaoh, his son was considered to be divine as the Pharaoh was considered to be divine because he would then be the one to take the throne uh, when the current Pharaoh died, when his father died. So uh, this is a direct attack by God on the whole concept of the deity of the Pharaoh. So all the firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sits on his throne, even to the firstborn of the female servant who is behind the handmill, and all the firstborn of the animals. Now, some of you who are tracking with me and remember what we covered the last time are going to say, well, wait a minute. Wait a minute, I thought all the animals were dead. And it sort of sounds that way. And uh, I wanted to go back and address this uh, last time. When we looked at the fifth, at the, when we looked at the fifth plague, the comment was made in verse 6, and this is in chapter 9, verse 6. So the Lord did this thing on the next day, and all the livestock of Egypt died. Now, if all the livestock of Egypt died, which is what 9, 6 says, then how can the firstborn of the animals uh, die in chapter 11? I thought they all died back in chapter 9. Seems that way, doesn't it? Well, and, and then you have the plague of hail, which had another problem. Well, you have to look back at um, verse 3, chapter 9, verse 3. Moses said, Behold, the hand of the Lord will be on your cattle in the field on the horses, on the donkeys, and on the camels, on the oxen, on the sheep, a very severe pestilence. That key phrase is in the field. Those that were sheltered in the barns, uh, in the stables, were not affected, only those in the field. This is, the same phrase occurs in the ninth, uh, excuse me, in the seventh plague, which is the uh, plague of, of the hail, and says um, in verse 19, with the warning of the hail raining down in verse 18, says, Therefore send now gather your livestock and all that you have in the field, for the hail shall come down on every man and every animal which is found in the field and is not brought home, and they shall die. So it appears that they had an opportunity to protect some of their livestock by bringing it into the barns, bringing it into the, into the stables, but those that were left out in the pasture, those are the ones that suffered judgment. So they it didn't wipe out all of their uh, domestic stock, 
in one blow, but it did take out a large segment of them. But there's still a tremendous amount left. And now in verse 5 of chapter 11, with the plague of the firstborn, is going to come on the humans as well as the animals from everyone. And verse 6 gives the the uh, consequence of it. There shall be a great cry throughout all the land of Egypt, such as was not like it before. In other words, this is a -a one-of-a-kind judgment, nor shall be like it again. Now that language is very similar to the language that Jesus uses in Matthew 24 to talk about the judgments at the last half of the tribulation period. Daniel used it to refer to the judgments during the tribulation period. And so this foreshadows that. It is the tribulation judgments are worldwide and they are one of a kind. So verse 8 goes on to say, And all these your servants shall come down to me and bow down to me, saying, Get out, and all the people who follow you, after that I will go out. In other words, Moses is saying that uh, when this happens, all the people, all the servants of Pharaoh will come to me, and they will they will beg us to leave. And the Lord said to Moses, But Pharaoh will not heed you, so that my wonders may be multiplied in the land of Egypt. So Moses and Aaron did all these wonders before Pharaoh, the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and did not let the children go out of the land, so the judgment is going to be enacted. Now chapter 12 gives the escape clause for the Israelites, and that is the Passover. And the Passover is that key event around which I think all of the Old Testament hangs, because this Passover event is the major picture of redemption and judgment in the Old Testament, of course, the flood was in Genesis chapter 6, but this is even more so, and it is picked up as such in the, um, in the New Testament. God begins a new calendar, verse 2. This month shall be a beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. So this is the month of Nisan in their religious calendar. It's the seventh month of their civil calendar, the Rosh Hashanah, uh, occurs for us in um, uh, and on our calendar around September, late September, early October, and that begins the civil calendar. But the religious calendar, the calendar related to the observances and the uh, related to the spiritual life of Israel, begins in Nisan, which is roughly the mid, from the middle of March to the middle of of April. That period in the spring. So the instructions are given. The first instruction is that the congregation on the 10th of the month, very specific, on the 10th of the month, every man will take for himself, according to the house of his father, a lamb for a household. So the lamb is going to take care of a whole household. That speaks to unlimited atonement, that not everyone in the house may believe or trust or understand what's going on with the Passover, but nevertheless, the, that one lamb would take care of everyone who was in the house. That's unlimited uh, atonement. So they were to take a lamb, and they were to take him on the 10th day, and they were to examine the lamb for four days. It was not to be killed or sacrificed until the 14th. On the, in the fifth verse we read, Your lamb shall be without blemish. A male of the first year, literally a son of the first year, so it's about a a year old. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats, and you will keep it until the 14th day of the same month, and the whole assembly of Israel shall kill it at twilight, or between the uh, sunsets is kind of how it reads in the the Hebrew. So there's debate about exactly when uh, that was to have taken place. But these are all instructions for the initial observance of Passover. Things changed. I'm not sure really when some of the other elements came in, but this has to do with the first, the, the fir- very first Passover. So they would kill it at probably between the period of sunset and complete darkness. And then uh, they would take the blood from this lamb that was without spot or blemish, and they would put it on the doorposts and on the lintel of the houses where they eat it. And then they shall eat the flesh on that night, roasted in fire, with unleavened bread, with bitter herbs, they shall eat it. Now, the lamb is <clears throat> foreshadows the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
foreshadows the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, as Paul indicates in 1 Corinthians 5, 7. Therefore, purge out the old leaven. He uses all the symbolism here in applying this to the, to the life of the church there in Corinth. Purge out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump. So it's the picture of the unleavened bread. Since you are truly unleavened, and here's the point, for indeed Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. So that's his point. Jesus Christ is clearly identified as our Passover, as the Passover lamb. This is what John referred to, John the Baptist, in John one twenty nine, when he saw Jesus coming toward him, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And so when uh, an Israelite would hear this, they're thinking of that sacrificial lamb, they're thinking of the Passover lamb, and there's an identification made in the New Testament that that lamb, that Passover lamb that was without spot or blemish, was to depict the Lord Jesus Christ. Peter says the same thing in 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19. Uh, begins with a causal participle because you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your uh, aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ. Remember that phrase, blood of Christ, indicates his death. Uh, with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. So the New Testament makes a direct claim that Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of the picture from the Old Testament that that Passover lamb was portraying something about the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. The fact that it was without blemish, without spot or blemish, indicated the impeccability or sinlessness of the Lord Jesus Christ, of the Messiah, that he would be without sin. The reason that the lamb is kept from the 10th to the 14th is to examine it, to evaluate, to make sure that it is without spot or blemish. It was a time of examination and investigation. So Jesus entered into Jerusalem on the 10th day of Nisan in 33 AD. This is what we call Palm Sunday, although I don't think it was on Sunday. He enters into Jerusalem on that day, and then he is examined until the day of preparation, which is when he is sacrificed. The day of preparation would actually technically be the 13th, because Passover, by the time of, of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, time of the life of Christ in Judea, the day began at dusk. And so from dusk to dusk, you have, uh, you have your day, the count of your daytime. John says Jesus died on the day of preparation. So the 14th begins at nightfall on Wednesday, and Jesus is sacrificed on the cross that afternoon of the day of preparation between 12 noon uh, and 3 p.m. So, that, so he is evaluated when you read through the gospel accounts between the period of his entry into Jerusalem until he is taken, arrested uh, at the Last Supper, there is a time when he is constantly being questioned and interrogated by the Sadducees, by the Pharisees, by the Herodians. This is the examination of the Passover lamb from God. He is being evaluated to see if he is in all that testing and he passes that all of that testing and temptation that occurs and show, demonstrating that he is qualified to go to the cross. And he is the Lamb. The Lamb, as I've said many times in our Revelation series, is used some 27 times as the favorite title that John uses of Jesus in uh, Revelation uh, Revelation 13, uh, 8. is one, one of those passages. All who dwell on the earth will worship him whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the world, indicating that the plan of God uh, was from the beginning of creation to uh, offer the second person of the Trinity as the substitute for mankind. And so there's this evaluation period between the 10th and the 14th. And then there's specific description given about the, the sacrifice. He's to be killed. He's, the, the carcass is then to be roasted. 
and they would take some of the blood and put it on the doorpost and on the lintel. The, door, the lintel is the cross piece at the top of the door. And so if you have blood on each doorpost and blood on the top, and then you connect the dots, you have a cross. And that is the foreshadowing of, of the cross and the, and the death of Christ. So they shall, there's specific instructions given then, and then verse 8, they shall eat the flesh on that night. Eating is a picture of fellowship. It is also a picture of accepting something into yourself. You are receiving it into yourself, and so it becomes a picture of a faith. Anyone can eat, anyone can believe, and eating is taking something and making it a part of yourself and so trusting in Christ is depicted by eating. It's the same picture we have in the Lord's table. When we eat the bread, drink the cup, that is a depiction of faith that we have accepted Christ. We are receiving him uh, into our life. So there, to eat the flesh on that night with unleavened bread, the bread, of course, we learn later, from later revelation, depicts the humanity of Christ. It is unleavened because leaven depicts sin, and so the the bread is to be unleavened. There is no sin there because the bread pictures Jesus Christ as the bread of life. And they are to eat it with bitter herbs, and the bitter herbs depict the bitterness of the slavery that they have had under the an Egyptian bondage. And so the bitter herbs depict sin, and the solution to the sin is, of course, the uh, substitutionary sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. So they are not to eat it. The, then verse 9 says, do not eat it raw uh, or boiled, but roasted in fire. Why? Because it's judgment. There is a particular kind of death that the Savior had to go through. He could not have uh, died from being hit over the head. He could not have died from... Uh, just any kind of death. He couldn't have just said, okay, I'm going to die for the sins of the world and had a a cardiac arrest. Uh, He had to die a violent, penal death because it is depicting the fact that he is the one being judged for for our sins. And then verse 10, you shall not let any of it remain until morning. Uh, Anything that remained would be burned up with fire. And so then they were instructed that after they ate it, they would stand up eating it that first time because they were ready to leave. God was going to release them from their bondage, and they were eating in haste. Now later, one of the questions in the Jewish Passover is why did they eat standing up and we lying down? It is because that first time they were being delivered from slavery, and now they can eat lying down resting because they are resting in what God has already done. It's a great picture of the faith rest life of the believer that because Christ has done it all, we have a sufficient Savior, a sufficient salvation, a sufficient Savior, and a sufficient Scripture, we can rest in the provision of God. Now that doesn't mean that life is always going to be easy. Uh, It doesn't mean that at all. Uh, God didn't promise us a life without adversity, but He promised us the resources to handle the adversity and to live in and with the adversity without letting the adversity overwhelm us in discouragement, depression, sadness, and uh, failure. That's one of the things that, that people always have trouble with. Uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says that there is no testing taken you, but such as is common to man, but God is faithful and will, with the testing, make a way to escape. And most people never hear the rest of the verse. They just, oh, good, God's going to get me out of this, and things are going to change, and life's going to be good. I'm going to get to escape it. No, it's a way to escape that you may be able to endure it. What? That means you're going to stay in and under the pressure. God's not going to take it away. And this is something I was talking to a pastor earlier today, and he said that is the biggest trouble, mentioned somebody I knew, that they have is that they keep... What they hear, no matter how much you tell them differently, that all they hear is that somehow God's going to change your circumstances. And that verse doesn't say God's going to change their circumstances. It's going to change your mental attitude. When you're focused on Christ, your mental attitude changes so you can handle the circumstances. But God's not going to change your circumstances just because it's tough. 
it, it's tough, and that's what you have to learn to handle to grow and mature uh, as a believer. So they're ready to, uh, <clears throat> they're ready to leave. They have uh, dressed, they've packed, and uh, they're ready to go. And that night, verse 12, God says, I will pass through the land of Egypt on that night and will strike the firstborn in the land of Egypt. God strikes the firstborn. Two years old, seven years old, 14 years old, 25 years old. And the liberals have a terrible time with this. How can, how can you worship this God that kills babies, that kills children, that kills teenagers, just because they're firstborn? And what they, they don't realize is, number one, every Egyptian was told what the escape clause was. That all you have to do is take the, take the lamb that is without spot or blemish, sacrifice it, and put the blood on your doorpost, and the firstborn will not die. But they, uh, they refuse to accept God's provision of deliverance for the tenth judgment. The second thing they, they fail to note is that they, they blow up the, this uh, a false idea of love. And they then impose that on God. It's just such arrogance that that little bitty finite man, it's like you go out in your backyard and you have this little ant stand up in the ant bed and start shaking his fist at you and say, you know, you just don't do anything right. I'm going to tell you how to do everything and how to take care of this yard. And and that's exactly what it's like when you have uh, these liberal theologians come along and say that this is just, how can this be a, a, a loving God? Well, they always focus on the, the, the person who's being punished, and they never focus on the, the crime itself and the fact that, that God is, because he is righteous and just and love, he must execute justice among sinful, rebellious creatures. And he gives them grace upon grace upon grace upon grace, opportunity after opportunity to turn to God's solution because he not only tells them there's going to be judgment, but he gives them a way out every time. But they reject that. And so now God is the one who is going to bring that judgment upon them. So as we go continue to go through chapter 12, <clears throat> God says in verse 13 that when... He sees the blood, he will pass over the house, and the judgment will not be upon you. And what happened this night was that that there were thousands of firstborn in the houses of Egypt that died, but none, not one, in the house of Egypt. That's the doctrine of separation, and separation is based on obedience to God's, uh, God's revelation. So, verse 14 this day shall be to you a memorial. Just the same language that we have with the Lord's table. It is a memorial, something to remember. You shall keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. You shall keep it as a feast by an everlasting ordinance. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. So the day of Passover is the first day of that week observance of unleavened bread. And on the first day, which is the day of Passover... On the first day you shall remove leaven from your houses, for whoever eats un, uh, eats leavened bread from the first day until the seventh day, that person shall be cut off from Israel. Now that doesn't mean they're, they're, it's not capital punishment, but they are they are kicked out. They lose their citizenship. They are removed from the congregation because of their disobedience to God. So God obviously took that to be very important. Why? Because it is depicting something about the person of the Savior. You can't mess around with what God has said in God's description of these events. Now, verse 16 says, on the first day there shall be a holy convocation, a holy assembly. The people will come together the first day and on the seventh day for, uh, for worship. Verse 17, you'll observe the Feast of Unleavened Bread, for on this same day I will have brought your, your armies out of the land of Egypt, Therefore, you shall observe this day throughout your generations as an everlasting ordinance. And so he goes on to describe some of the ba uh, basics. Uh, repeats uh, Moses then repeats the uh, instructions for the, the, applying the blood. Verse 22, he says, you shall take a bunch of hyssop. Hyssop is always used.
hyssop, hyssop is always used in a context of purification, in a context of purification or cleansing. So they take the hyssop, dip it in the blood, and put it on the, on the lintel. And so that, that is described. And then we get into the result of the plague, verses 29 and 30, uh, and all, where all throughout Egypt, it says there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was not a house where there was not one dead. So it shows that in Egypt there's virtually a 100% disobedience. They, even after nine judgments, they still don't get it that it's going to happen, that when Moses said, thus saith the Lord, that God was going to bring it about. That shows the hardness of the unbeliever, the hardness of the person who is set against God. It's not about reason. This has got to be one of the most irrational things that you can think of. But it has nothing to do with reason. How in the world, we think, can someone who has witnessed these previous nine plagues and they hear what's going to happen, refuse to believe it's going to happen. It's because they're rejecting God. It's not because they are stupid. It's that they, they, they have made a prior decision uh, to reject God and a biblical view of reality. And so we see that around us all the time. People again and again, friends, family members, they just don't want to have anything to do with Christianity, and they reject it completely from, from the foundation all the way up. They don't want to have anything to do at all with Christianity, and they never will. But our job as believers is to constantly be um, kind, constantly be giving them the gospel, looking for opportunities. We don't want to uh, absolutely drive them away by uh, pestering them with the gospel, but looking for those and praying for those God-given opportunities we have that God can create certain situations that will make them um, teachable or give them, an, uh, give them an opportunity to listen uh, again. Now, when you get a little further down into chapter 12, we have the various uh, regulations related to the Passover. Verse 43, the Lord said to Moses, this is the ordinance of the Passover, no foreigner shall eat it. It's not for Gentiles. It is only for Israel because this is a picture of what he is doing for the nation as a whole in redeeming them, the payment price to free them from bondage to sin. I mean, to, to, to Egypt, which is a picture of our bondage, our bondage to sin. Second, verse 44, every man's servant who is bought for money, when you have circumcised it, then he may eat it. In other words, circumcision is a picture of being uh, loyal and identifying with the Abrahamic covenant. That was the sign of the Abrahamic covenant. The Sabbath is a sign of the Mosaic covenant. So it only applied to a servant if that servant was identified with identifying himself with Israel and with the uh, Abrahamic covenant. In contrast, a sojourner, this would be someone who was just traveling through, the, through uh, Goshen or someone who was just temporarily staying with them, and a hired servant shall not eat it because they, they're they not identified with the Abrahamic covenant. Uh, in verse 46, in one house it shall be eaten. You shall not carry any of the flesh outside of the house, uh, nor shall you break uh, one of its bones. So it's to be eaten in the house with the family. Each household had its own uh, lamb. You couldn't transfer. You can't transfer your faith to somebody else in the house uh, no lamb was to be broken because no bone was going to be broken when Jesus was on the cross. That's the depiction there. Uh, verse 48, when it's, uh, verse 47, all the congregation of Israel should keep it. 48, when a stranger dwells with you and wants to keep the Passover to the Lord, let all his males be circumcised and then let him come near and keep it. And he shall be as a native of the land for no uncircumcised person shall eat. So this is how a Gentile would become identified with Israel and become part of uh, Israel. They would be, be, a, be a proselyte and become and enter into the heritage of Abraham. There are several Gentiles, such as Rahab and Ruth, who enter into uh, Israel. <coughs> Rahab was a Canaanite, lived in, in uh, Jericho. Ruth was a Mo 
Moabitess, and they are both in the lineage of the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 49, one law shall be for the native born, for the stranger, and for the stranger who dwells among you. So you have two, two different uh, rules or regulations there. And verse 50 summarizes it, thus all the children of Israel did, as the Lord commanded Moses and Aaron, so they did. And it came to pass on that very same day that the Lord brought the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt according to their armies. And so that brings us to the next verse, which is going to emphasize the escape from Egypt, the deliverance itself, as Moses parts the Red Sea. So next time we will take a look at the issues related to their departure, the Red Sea, their uh, advance to Mount Sinai, and the role that the parting of the Red Sea plays in terms of being a picture of baptism in, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 through 3. Remember, Sunday morning we'll be meeting right here uh, as usual. No change. Let's bow our heads and close in prayer. Father, we're thankful for this time to study your word this evening, to just be reminded of the tremendous faith that Moses had and that the Israelites had. They trusted you, and they were able to relax inside of their homes, knowing that the death of that lamb was a picture of the sufficient death of Christ, knowing that they were covered and that there was nothing to fear and that they could face whatever challenges were there because you were in control. And, Father, that same principle needs to be applied in our lives. We face numerous negative circumstances in our lives, challenges, difficulties, adversities, day-by-day tests, and we need to learn to relax and trust you and focus on our mission as those who represent you to the world, those who communicate the gospel, those who are to shine as lights in the midst of a wicked and perverse generation. And, Father, we pray that we not forget who we are and what we are called to do. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.